Hello and welcome back to Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical. This week on the podcast, it is a two-part special all about land art. And you're currently listening to part two. It's not a problem if you haven't listened to part one, but you might want to go back and familiarise yourself with Leoka, who I'm speaking with. And in part one, we discuss the land artist Walter de Maria and his two works, Earth Room and Mile Long Drawing. In part two, Leoka and I discuss Michael Heiser and his two works, Double Negative and Munich Depression. Throughout the episode, we discuss pushing the boundaries of land art, why land art is an important movement, what it means to create something that was only ever meant to be temporary, why photography is such an important element within land art, and what we can learn about ourselves by creating something that was only ever meant to be temporary. Without further ado, let's get into it. Here is part two of our land art special. I think now's a really great time to bring it to Michael Heiser, who is the other artist that you again have introduced me to today. So two brand new artists. And this is what I love about art history. You just, you're always finding people. There's always, you can never know it, everything. And you know, you, I mean, you know it yourself, you're an art historian, you're always learning, you're always discovering people. And that's half the fun of it actually, is oh, there's still so many options and so many routes and people to, to discover and, and ways to sort of go down. Um, so did you come across Michael Heiser when you were at university as well? Or was this something that that you found independently? Yeah, okay. So basically, uh, this is a really good question. Um, and I think I did find Michael Heiser with Walter De Maria together because um, I was very interested in the transatlantic dialogue between American and um, German mm. artists in that period. So I kind of found them because they both exhibited in Munich at the time. And I think what is kind of really striking to me is that they were really close friends mm. um, and they were working together for a long time, like in terms of supporting each other, in terms of when um, Walter de Maria was traveling around Europe in 1968. Um, he exhibited in a, a Heiser, Friese, like in a Friedrich Gallery, right? And then he said, oh, Heiser, you can come here and exhibit with this dealer as well. Like, you know, he made the connection with that. Like he said, oh, it actually would be great. Um, so I kind of like, I see them as really close in their personal relationship, but they're really different um, uh, with their artistic practices. And what I mean by different is that as much as Walter de Maria was a kind of, he had a very conceptual approach to land art. Um, his work was all about the ideas of space and the gallery space and the space far away. Heider was more uh, of the materialist in the sense like he really, why he went to the deserts and did his artworks in there was because he really liked the location. He really liked um, digging the earth, like quite frankly, you know. Um, so this is what is very striking to me that you can see those very kind of close people, like the very close people they were, but um, their practices are quite completely different. Mm. You know? Yeah, I, I thought it was a very, uh, I found a really lovely article actually with, um, and if you haven't read it, I will I will send it to you. So Heiner Friedrich, who ran the Friedrich Gallery in Munich, that we had, that we, you mentioned very briefly that Walter de Maria had gone out and done his um, F room there. And it was only in here, in that interview, that they started talking about Walter de Maria and their friendship, because essentially they had both gone out to Munich at, at certain points to work on two very different projects. Um, but I just thought it was so, it's so interesting because for me, he leaves me a bit cold and he's one of these people where I'm sort of like, oh, okay. 
I can see what he's doing, but it doesn't speak to me in the same way that, you know, Walter De Maria's work does. Does that make sense? And in, in that, I think I'm going to have to spend a bit more time with this, and I'm determined to try and come to some conclusions with it. I mean, even if I can't, I suppose that's that. That's really the point of it, you know. That you just nothing. It doesn't need to have a solid conclusion. Um, mm. But mm-hmm. and this is me just essentially thinking out loud now. But um, I mean, let's start talking about double negative because this one for oh, me, that's really good. Yeah, this one for me, I was like, "What is this?" And okay, yeah, no, yeah. Okay, I mean, I'm I'm so glad you wanted to talk about this one first rather than Munich Depression because um, I I really wanted to have some sort of like um, background before going into Munich Depression. Mm. I do very much agree with you that his work, uh, I mean, sl- can slightly appear less moving in terms of um, it is it is kind of cold, mm. but also like um, as a, like from the very art historical perspective, I'm really. I'm so fascinated by Munich Depression. I, I can't even stress it. But just because I know a lot of like details about the work and its location, but also like reading about the um, biography of Michael Heiser, it is, I mean, at least to me, it's difficult to relate to the work then, knowing the biography of the artist. Um, because um, I will just go back saying that he is... Um, so basically the artist uh, who graduated from uh, San Francisco Art Institute and then went to New York he was like a painter and then he realized he wants to do something radically different in terms of like invent his own art and he always was like this is my own art like land art is something like my own practice is very much not influenced by anyone I'm doing my own thing so his idea of inventing something new was actually going back home and digging the earth in faraway locations, locations that have like nothing around them. And they were basically deserts, like no kind of infrastructure, no, um, you know, no cities and nothing. And, um, And this is very interesting because as a young child, he used to travel a lot with his father, uh, who was an archaeologist. Oh. And yeah this is very very interesting and his father was like um actually um into um indigenous uh kind of uh, indigenous past of the usa like he was um going to mexico and going to uh even like um south america and uh, exploring the indigenous kind of uh, nations ancient in like ancient nations of basically uh, the americas and this is where I think Heiser's, you know, idea of um, going far away and kind of like creating something new, like, um, comes from. Because he, as a child, he was exposed to this, like, the worlds that are kind of out there, but they're not accessible to everyone. They're not accessible to, you know, people who live in the city, people who are not interested in the history. And he always knew that this, there, there is a world out there and he wanted to kind of explore it. So, and also he was a very kind of an eccentric artist. He always wore like a cowboy boots <laughs> and hats and things like that. He was really embracing his identity as a Westerner, as this kind of like, um, yeah, this kind of like a frontier Westerner, which is kind of like an oppressive, very oppressive idea you know going away and like um taking over the land um and um so that it, this is actually what brings the success of his work a lot of a lot of the time he was successful because of his image because like for example the collector called robert skull uh actually was interested in collecting his work and not in not collecting actually just uh, giving him funds to do the work because he was drawn by his um, personality, you know. Um, so th- he is like a very, his biography and his personality is very much like 
contentious to me. I can't, you know, <laughs> I can't really relate to him. I can't, um, um, you know, understand his life experience, um, kind of the privilege he had as a child traveling around um, like America and, you know, being exposed to this kind of archaeological inventions. Um, but also what is so about this work um double negative um so he created this work um this is like very formally the work that is a, just a really huge hole like into the desert of nevada and the whole idea of double negative is that if you have a sculpture which is a three-dimensional you know object in the space um he said i will make a sculpture which is like um a negative sculpture that means it's not an object it's the lack of the object you know um so it is it's that sound also a bit conceptual yeah but, um, his whole idea was like that the artwork is a the um, you know the void in a way the sculptural void so this is why it's called double negative mm. um because there's that, that makes sense. it does in a way. I mean, there's that great, um, so it, this work has its own website for anyone that's interested. And I'll leave a link to that in the show notes below. And he's got this great quote on there that says, so this is Michael Heisner, uh, Heiser rather, there is nothing there, yet it is still a sculpture. And it's more sort of the act, again, for me, what I see, it's more of, the act of trying to manipulate the earth and structure, I don't, I don't know, structure Mother Earth, because it's right on the, the sort of cusp of this sort of canyon, if you will. And he's mm -hmm. just made these two trenches at either end of this sort of chasm that cascades down in the middle of the desert. And and it completely makes sense now why you've sent me so many images because when you look when you when you get a shot within the work within the sort of trench if you will if you're standing in one of the trenches you're kind of just like okay but then when you have an aerial view of it you can see that it has been very much thought out it kind of looks like someone's tried to almost I don't know, put a saw or something like that. I mean, I, this is what I have in my head. You know, if you have like a band saw and you, you're sort of pressing it down, it kind of, it's, they're, they're very, you know, they're parallel on each side mm -hmm. of this chasm. Um, I don't know. It's, it's so funny. It's interesting now that I know his dad was, you know, an archaeologist and the fact that, you know, what do they do? They, they, they dig they dig down and they try and find a world that's lost beneath your feet. That's essentially what they do. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what he's he's trying to do here for me anyway. Maybe he's trying to show that, you know, the workings of underneath you and that there's nothing there, but you should still appreciate it because it's it's without it, nothing would be steady. I don't know. It's... I don't know. It's a funny one. I really, honestly, these, it's so interesting how one artist, I can speak for 40 minutes, not a problem, have a really great back mm -hmm. and forth. And then something like this, I'm like, oh. No, definitely, Joe. Like, don't even, I feel like your experience of the artwork is from like the images is very valid. And just because I remember reading one article by Philip Leiter. Who was um, who is a found who was a founder of Art Forum magazine, and the article was all about his traveling in in the West uh, during the summer, and it was like um, a diary kind of entry, you know, very informally written, and um, basically uh, in that article he was describing how he went to see Michael Heiser's double negative, and mm -hmm. and it was like the whole trip, um, you know, the whole journey was more important than the artwork itself it oh. was something you know 
this whole idea that you have to go somewhere so far away and it's exotic and it's like not even exotic it's kind of like even daunting you know um it's difficult to access it and it's difficult to um when you do arrive to the location it's difficult to find it because it's in the ground rather than you know being um outside and uh, you you might be mix up with other kind of like natural bumps in the land and natural you know trenches so um it was like the whole idea of the artwork because the article is from around the time it was created was that you have to travel there and you have to have to be exposed to this world um of michael kaiser like the way he sees the world, I guess, mm. which is a bit, yeah, I, I do understand. This is kind of like an odd, um, very kind of very personal approach to the artworks. Yeah, but I, su- I suppose it, speaking from someone with a sculpture background, it's, it's just essentially mm-hmm. a site specific work that the, is, land, yeah. that the landscape in itself is every bit as important as as the work, as the act of, of digging this out. And, you know, like like you said, you know, you, you do have to kind of almost make this sort of pilgrimage to get out there. And it's something that I noticed on the website because it gives you, it's essentially, it tells you, it has things like, you know, what, what's the time that you can see this? And it goes 365, 24 seven. Um, mm-hmm. It's always open for people to explore. And then it gives you the directions but then it also tells you, you have to be careful when you're here, don't travel alone. You have to tell people where you're mm-hmm. coming. You have to make sure you bring water. So there's all these things that you have to do in order to physically get there um, before you can even experience, before you can even just experience the work in itself. It's very interesting. I'm so glad we're talking about it though, because I was sort of like, oh no, I don't know how I feel about this. But again, that's still a very valid response. Like, you don't have to always love something or hate something. It's, you know, it, this is the whole part of art, really. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting to pick these things apart and how you come at it from, oh, let's understand a background of the artist completely makes sense because then that just it, it helps pieces fall into place. Mm-hmm. But I mean, what did you think when you first saw this? Were you like, what on earth is this? <laughs> I mean, I honestly, I discovered the Munich Depression first after, Uh. yeah, after I did discover the double negative. So I had a very, a a little bit different, kind of a a different perspective to it because I knew the artist, I knew his practice. But I mean, um, yeah, I kind of like always felt that I don't understand it. And Mm. this is kind of like, um, it was very often kind of frustrating to me to to know that I would love to go and always like I always associate this work with the kind of like like a trip to to the location I always imagine it as a kind of like a film that you have to go there and then you kind of get lost in the desert no hopefully don't get lost but like you know you're immersed by this desert surrounding and then you see it so I mean I never was too invested in the images of the artwork. And I, mm. I, I would honestly say that I, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the images and reflecting how I feel about it. Because, yeah, it is, it's kind of like, maybe that's a part of it is because I feel uncomfortable with it. I feel like I don't, have, I don't know how to, you know, approach it. I don't know yeah. how I, I, you know, what to talk about it. I can tell you a story about it, but I can't, you know, describe what it actually is. And um, it yeah, always, it, yeah, it's very easy for me to link it with like the persona of the artist. It's than... funny when you were talking there, I, I was kind of like, oh, so actually it's something that takes from you more than it gives. Because when you look at art normally, mm-hmm you have this thing where it makes you feel something. You're like, oh my gosh, I love this or I hate this or it reminds me of something. Where this, you you invest more into sort of trying to work it out than what the piece actually gives you back. And maybe that's why I'm struggling with it. 
you that just saying so that's true. made made me think of this there and I was like oh it's it's a taker it's not a giver this work of art um yeah. how maybe interesting it goes back with the idea of double negative in terms of like yeah it does it is just kind of like taking away rather than giving you something mm, well that's it I think it's interesting as well that the artist um I kind of laughed when I read this. It was like, oh, he doesn't want any sort of conservation work done to it. And I was like, mm. conservation work done to it. He's dug a hole. In the, what is this? But it's the idea that he he's very happy for the land to sort of reclaim it. If, if you know, a landslide happens or something and the work mm -hmm. then disappears forever. That's also part of the work's history. So I thought that's very interesting because that's a very common theme in running with land art that it's eventually reclaimed or it has the opportunity to be reclaimed at some point so and I really like that idea of I don't know just kind of a tip of the cap to the fact that nature is so much more powerful than any idea we'll ever have so at mm. any point it can reclaim it and I really love that with land art and yeah, it just it's so interesting. Okay, let's move on and talk about double negative, not double negatives, sorry. Let's move on and talk about Munich depression. Okay. Because no. mm -hmm. the images that you sent me when I, the first one that I saw was obviously the figure of the two people in mm -hmm. this hole, which I didn't know anything about. And when I see it, it's you can see that it's been worked by machinery. Mm -hmm. it's also black and white images it's a very I don't know grim image it, it's one of these things where it's titled very well so let's so what is Munich depression for anyone listening okay um so Munich depression is another artwork by uh, Michael Heiser and um it has been created it's also like a very site specific work and the site itself, it's so interesting to me that I can't like, I, that's why I love the artwork because um, basically uh, Heiner Friedrich, um, the dealer of the Heiner Friedrich uh, gallery in, in Munich, he invited uh, by the, the good word of uh, De Maria invited uh, Michael Kaiser to create an artwork in the gallery space. But then um, Heiser was like, oh, yeah, but I, I love doing, um, you know, artworks in the deserts. And uh, it, he was like, OK, we don't have desert in Munich. We don't have desert in Germany. You know, we don't have enough space. We're not like living in this <laughs> void and, you know, this um, kind of um, accessible space. And uh, he said, yeah, but maybe we can try and find somewhere like something, some sort of like location you could work in and they found this district um in munich uh where the construction work was going on uh where new houses were built like new district was designed and developed and they had like um s some space like some land laid out for for the buildings uh and um, um they basically negotiated with the company who were working uh, at the time um, on the on the buildings and they said yeah the company was like yeah sure you can you can make an artwork and but you will know that we you know will 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 destroy it in in a in the very near future so basically um, they said yeah as long as it's for, for the duration of the exhibition um, it's not going to be destroyed this is fine with us and then um, what is very striking to me is that around the time in Munich there was um housing crisis um, because of like the economic boom which happened in Germany after Marshall's plan after the uh, kind of American investment in in German Germany's economy and mm. um, so around the time it was like um, a lot of like um, a middle class um, a middle class was kind of developing and people needed more housing more like um, more like bigger houses, bigger housing, because they had um, like more stable incomes. And, um, and basically it was that district was the reflection of, of the housing crisis. It was like um, um, a direct 
you know, response to the, the things that were going on in, in Munich at the time. And mm. so this American artist comes in, he digs a hole, um, say, and um, saying, this is my artwork. And he leaves a note in the gallery saying, um, there won't be an exhibition inside the gallery. You have to go to that district and, and see the artwork. Yeah, um, and also this is very, very striking because um, Heiser has not created anything like this. He did, like, he did, um, b before, he did experiment something with, like, um, in the desert. He did experiment some, with some works in the desert, but it wasn't official. He was just trying to figure out his style and his um, uh, own ideas about the artworks. But then he was invited to... Uh, to the Munich and he, it was like this his very first official work um, in this you know location in this very like contentious space in a very um, politically and economically charged space. So what was like was there a reason behind this this work because I don't really think we've described it it's essentially just a big hole in the ground I mean just to be very sort of brutal about it and its analysis there was this huge hole that was dug in the ground mm -hmm. and he invited people mm -hmm. to to come into the, the hole I mean there was several ways you can view it you can you could view for, you know sort of stand on the sort of the cusp looking in to the the void if you will or you could walk down into the, this pit mm -hmm. and look up this is essentially what people what people could do. And what was, I mean, my question: what was the, what was the point? What was he trying to sort of hit home to people? What was he trying to do? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, in terms of viewing experience, I think or everything across the board general, with the work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, um, I think yeah. I guess it it did it does go back to our. Um, conversation about double negative when we said that I think you said that it is very interesting how um, he maybe not interesting but like he is digging into the like into the earth as in like kind of with an kind of arch archaeological intention to discover something even though there's nothing beneath it you know he knows like he won't find anything in particular he's not looking for anything but it's just interesting to um look at the earth inside out like just to kind of subvert the way we see mm. our reality in terms of yeah this is the earth but we can what happens if we dig into this what our like our experience of it will change our experience of you know this location will change our experience of in generally of the environment we live in will change you know and this is kind of yeah then again going to um the uh, subversive movements that these artists come from, you know, their cultural kind of background. They are coming from the uh, 1970s California where everyone is like trying to uh, figure out new ways of living and he is digging a hole in the earth um, just to um, show maybe new perspectives, you know, uh, kind of just um, um, very, to affect maybe psyche of the viewer <laughs> it sounds a bit odd but like kind of to to make it striking in a way not by making anything aesthetically striking but just making uh environmentally you know striking like changing the yeah i, I immediate really environment. I love that and i love the fact that they didn't he didn't really warn people that you just you turned up at the gallery expecting to see this thing and then you were sort of like told no, here's the address, go here. Um, and interesting that it, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I just love the idea of artworks that play on people's perception and how you see things and how you interact with things. And, and again, going back to what we've been saying, you know, the continuous theme throughout, how it makes you feel in that moment. When you're inside this pit, do you feel... Um, do you feel empowered? Do you feel lost? Or just like if you're looking into the pit, do you feel a sense of doom that there's this sort of rush down the way? Um, I don't know. It's it's so interesting. And, and I love the fact that it was essentially set up 
on a construction site that was going to regenerate parts of Germany after World War Two. And so interesting to think, because there is no way on earth mm -hmm. you could do that in Munich now. I mean, I know Munich as a city quite well. I used to live very close to Munich. Um, and mm. it's a bit like Berlin. It's kind of constantly a building site. They're always sort of building and modifying, but not in a way that there's a lot of land to play with, if you will. Um, so it's just mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. But then, as we said previously, you know, this was only here for a few weeks and then it was very quickly sort of turned into what is essentially now flats. But you can still get an essence of what the work was about and like as it was gifted to, I think it's the Whitney it was gifted to in 1996. And mm -hmm. um, essentially yes. what yeah. there's... So what I'm looking at now is an image of sort of projectors, very sort of old school industrial looking projectors, um, shooting what I'm assuming is images from the bottom of this pit that he had created. Yeah. So basically he, um, what he did when he was in Munich, he photographed, uh, photographed the artwork from within, like he just um, stood in the, in the hole inside of it. And I like took a an image of like three hundred and sixty kind of you know the whole impass encompassing view of it, and then um, because his whole idea was that um, it is, it I mean it can be experienced um, from the photographs if you um, basically project it in the gallery space, um, like in the same way it was photographed, if that makes sense. And um, I guess it is very interesting because as going back to like the mile long um, string artwork by uh, Walter De Maria, it, it is also very much curated. He, um, he does not like, um, he, he does, he kind of like suggests that you have to like the way you will experience the work is the way he wants you to experience it in the gallery space because he does uh, suggest a very specific point of view you know he does suggest that um everyone has to like go inside the hole to actually experience the work and um what also happens if you go inside the the hole that you don't see the the surroundings of of the whole of the artwork. You don't see the buildings that were being built. You are just immersed into the earth. You're like kind of like in the grave, mm. quite frankly. And you don't see anything, you know? Um, and it is kind of like him trying to reject the, the surrounding of the work as well, the way I see it at least. Um, and I think, yeah, I think this is this, um, artwork Munich Rotary which is um, the these photographs he took um, of uh, Munich depression that were giving to um, Whitney uh, Museum and uh, they are it is very different from what was the yeah. original work you know that way yeah That's it. hmm. it's it's so interesting and I mean it's great to sort of like talk through them all I love the I love the idea of physically having to climb down into something and I think that in itself is like sort of flipping the idea that art is this sort of thing on a pedestal that people really sort of look up to and it's sort of this like high powerful you know thing for the one percent I love the idea of people having to physically sort of climb down into something in order to experience it and it's a different way of Mm -hmm. I don't know, I think it's a very interesting way of, of interacting with art as well because you you remember something different, I think, if an action has to be taken and particularly something that might make you a bit uncomfortable. Like, it doesn't look like there's any sort of clear pathways down into this thing. I don't know, it's, um, yes, yeah, something quite playful and, mm -hmm. and just, the, just the names of it, Munich Depression must have been very yeah very wow yeah so strong isn't it and, 
especially when people are like really yeah. honestly struggling like socially with like um social housing like the housing crisis and like mm. all the political kind of um things we talked about like all the political struggles within like um the the country and the a city itself i mean in i i will just mention this like in 1950s and 60s there was this one artist group called spur uh, and they were um um like an avant-garde group who were re- very also like very subversive thinking people they are were trying to um challenge the everyday life of munich in in and by doing some sort of like very strange performances and you know by um you know kind of like provoking people um in their everyday lives and they were they were actually uh, really you know and it was something yeah it was i mean it was like 10 years ago uh 10 years before um before like those works were created by heiser and damaria but basically it was a very, very different moment in, in Germany. It was a very difficult moment. And having someone creating a work called Munich Depression and quite frankly, in a space where the depression was very, you know, yeah. visible. Um, this is kind of like very interesting to me. I feel like um, I feel like Heiser didn't, probably did not realize this. Um, he did not exploit this idea, like he did not uh, kind of um, elaborate on it. But um, I mean, as a, from like a viewer's perspective, it must have been very, um, very strong and very, you know, um, yeah, challenging. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think even even today, something like this wouldn't probably speak. I mean, if you, if someone did this, you know, in East London, perhaps, I think is probably the only place something like this could would maybe work if you think about it in context of, it was very sort of industrial, it was then sort of, you know, these industries have, have all mm-hmm. sort of disappeared. But even like in, con- you know, to bring it back to Germany rather at the time, you know, there, there's a, the, the whole country was really struggling. This Even though this is nearly what, 20, 30 years after the war had ended, you know, the country was divided mm-hmm. people were divided you still didn't really trust people it's um yeah it's a very interesting period in history because it's all very much during the cold war as well it's yeah and, and and thinking that and now looking at the image of the two figures sort of in black coats at the bottom of this pit i'm like oh are they reflecting are they are they hopeful? Like, what what are they feeling? What would you feel in, in that moment? But you can never recapture it, like you said. But you can try and give you a sort of essence of it. But it's a it's one I'm, I need to sit with. Mm-hmm. I need to sit with the uh, Heiser a little bit longer. I feel, uh, De Maria, we got on <laughs> absolutely swimmingly. Um, Heiser, he's one, he's one to ponder. I feel. Um, and that's probably the whole point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess it is um, also like you shouldn't forget about your own boundaries because, yeah, it does feel like Heiser is just kind of taking a lot from you yeah. rather than giving you something. Uh, so, I mean, it is very much about the context, but that is why I really enjoy the Munich Depression. It's something really striking to me to imagine that th- these things happen, even though the work doesn't exist anymore. Like, I mean, the original yeah. one in, in the Munich, you know, I mean, it, it just, maybe this fact, like the fact that it doesn't exist anymore also like really um, affects me in a very different way. It, it just kind of shows that, oh, um, you know, there was this moment in the history and it, and people were, actually uh, yeah. creating works around it and you, this is amazing do, do you know what, it, what it's amazing. reminded me of actually sort of looking at sort of the Munich Rotary so that the images that are projected in the Whitney it reminds me of Amzen mm-hmm. Kiefer's work he has this sort of very sort of heavily textured earth pieces um, and it really really reminds me of that um, so I wonder if, if that in any way has 
has been an influence to, to Kiefer's work, actually. It's just something that's hit me now. And again, we've been looking at this most mm. of the morning. It's just one of these things that, that has come to me now and having a conversation, which again, just sort of flips back around to why art is so brilliant, because you can look at something for three hours and be like, no idea. And then in a split second, you're like, oh my gosh, that's so funny. It links to this and it links to that. And when you think about the context of it, anyway, to save us going on and on, Mm-hmm. um yeah it's yeah oh my yeah, god oh my gosh I, so I was gonna wait till like we'd stop but it's so so funny when you said you know it he when he takes things for you from you I was like yeah I feel really really exhausted having to try and pick apart these pieces um so I think that's a brilliant place to sort of stop and and, and let people sort of wonder and yeah. if anyone listening please do go away and have a look at these artworks and we would love to know what you think. Um, always great to get other opinions on things because you could look at it and see something completely different. And also you've now got the context of, of how we feel but when we look at these things, you know, come back and let us know. Um, it has been so brilliant talking to you. Luca. thank you so, so much for coming on um, and talking to me about these two incredible artists and how hilarious that we're both like, oh my gosh, we're exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god joe thank you i mean i feel so honored to be invited um uh, to talk about it i mean i mean i i kind of wow this is it was amazing i i did learn quite a lot from this talk as well no so th- thank you so much for, thank you for like taking your time and uh talking to me and you know no of um, course yeah, well before you. you go where can people find you oh <laughs> that's a good question um i'm I think um, you can um, link my okay. LinkedIn and Instagram account in the okay. show notes, if that's okay. So yeah, if people feel like they want to um, chat more about land art or anything contemporary art, they can find me um, on LinkedIn or message me on Instagram. Perfect. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so, so much. This is, um, yeah, I, I've learned loads talking to you and it's been, oh, I've loved it. What a brilliant wee chat. Thank you so much. And there you have it, the end of another episode of Joe's Art History Podcast. First and foremost, I would like to thank Luca for being such a fabulous guest and speaking so passionately about both Walter de Maria and Michael Heiser. I really hope you've stuck around for the two episodes and completely agree with me that they were just fabulous and Luca was oozing with enthusiasm. This episode for me was a little different in that it was very, I don't know, I just, I really enjoyed sort of bouncing back and forth with her and really sort of digging in deep to sort of theories and artistic thinking. So I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. As always, any and all images we discuss can be found on my Instagram page on my highlights reel. So if you just look along the top of my Instagram to the number that corresponds with the podcast, all the images will be there. If you would like to get in touch, please do feel free. You can email me joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can get in touch via Instagram. My DMs are always open and it's always great when someone pins us a little message. Luca's Instagram details are in the show notes below so if you've enjoyed this episode please do make sure that you ping her a message as well and tell her how and what you enjoyed so much about the episode. It always means a lot when people take a minute just to thank my guests who are the backbone of this series. Finally my name is Jo McLaughlin, I've been your host and your friendly art historian and I look forward to welcoming you next time on Jo's Art History Podcast. Until then, keep learning and remember, art is for all. Bye.